Welcome back to another episode of the Grassroots Tennis Podcast, a platform created to entertain, educate, and grow the game of tennis at all levels. My friends call me Ship, but this show isn't about me. We will be bringing you inter interviews with coaches, community leaders, and players, along with updates about tennis happening around the world. Tennis is a culture, and we are all writing tennis history together. Today, I'm here with Nicolas Moreno de Alvarez. Uh, Nico, as I'm sure many of his friends call him, or Nick, uh, he played college tennis for UC Santa Barbara, and as an American tennis player, he had the opportunity to play tennis a lot of different places growing up. He's got a pretty diverse background that I'm sure he'd love to tell us all about. Uh, he currently reached uh, a career high of 142 in the world in the ATP rankings after his uh, title at the 75K Challenger in Tyler, Texas. Uh, Nico, welcome to the pod. Thank you very much. Happy to be here, and um, yeah, it's been it's been great um, connecting with you and uh, learning more about you. And for sure, I'm I'm a new fan of of gra grassroots tennis podcast. It is something that is growing at a snail's pace, but fast enough for me. It's it's. I think uh, the goal here really is. I want to have conversations that don't expire. Uh, someday there's going to be a, 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 an adult or a young kid or someone's going to fall in love with the game of tennis. And I may be on episode 5,000, but they are going to be able to go back to episodes one through 50 and learn something. And that's the goal. So as exciting as it is, uh, you know, with your, your title here at, at Tyler, Texas, uh, that's not where we're going to spend the majority of the conversation because I know someone of your level has had the opportunity, obviously, to have some great coaching, uh, some great tennis experiences, and you have knowledge that we can share and give back to the tennis community. So I want to start right there. Could you please tell me, sir, what is your racket of choice? So I'm playing with a Prestige. Uh, it's a pro stock. It's called PT57. Um, and yeah, I've been playing with it for the last three years. I used to play with the Babylon BS, but it didn't really make it anymore for uh, people that or players that weren't, you know, uh, high in the rankings. I'm now they they do have the racket available, but there was that you know time frame when I graduated from college to when I started playing pro that I needed some rackets and and they weren't Babel. I weren't making uh, that racket anymore, so I I changed to to the Prestige and I I, I haven't left it ever since. And are your rackets weighed down? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, I've changed, I've changed my weight and my specs uh, slightly throughout the the years, um, but right now they are yes. And at what age did you start weighing down your rackets? I would say like sixteen. Sixteen. I started doing them myself. Um, I just was obsessed with you know tennis and 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 everything that surrounds it and i would like google stuff and then i would try things out for sure at that age i had all my rackets you know their weight were different and the specs were all different but in my head they were the same <laughs> um but it wasn't until you know i graduated that i started doing it a bit more um professional um i do it with some guys here in uh in spain that that are really good and and um yeah you are someone that's been playing challengers now pretty consistently with your level and then obviously you've had the opportunity to play qualies at all the slams obviously you're playing tennis at a high level for people who maybe might be casual fans when you're ranked about 140 in the world there are 450 guys in the nba currently on active nba rosters if you're top 450 in the world at anything you are a freak of nature. So congratulations on being a freak. We are very proud of you. Obviously, you're doing <laughs> great things. But you recently got over the hump with this title at, in Tyler, Texas. Obviously, something to, to very much be proud of. That's a great win, winning a 75K. Uh, to get over the hump at the challenger level and to win a title, what did you have to be doing well? What is something that at that level you have to execute 
whether it be just putting in countless time and practice or that you know you have to execute on court in order to play at a level where you can win challengers and win titles at that level. Yeah, I think that most importantly, the difference between, um, you know, winning futures and winning uh, challengers, obviously I, I wouldn't be able to say uh, what it takes to win an ATP because I haven't done it, but I hope that yes. in the future I'd, I'd be able to tell you. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It's coming. Um, but I think that the biggest difference is that at the futures level, you get away with stuff. Um, you have matches where people are just, you know, missing or um, break points. They, they just miss returns or, you know, just, just giving away more than, than, one would like um and at the at the challenger level i feel like you have to win matches you know you have to actually um force the other person to hit an unforced uh sorry a forced error um mm -hmm. or you hit a winner and you have to have a very small amount of unforced errors and i feel like you know to to win a title especially when you're playing a final you you really have to go for it and you really have to win the final you know you can't just expect the guy to um you know miss and and give you a a break or or hand you games you know um here in the final in tyler i i i lost the first set and then we were on serve uh you know up until six all and i had to play another tie break and i was like look this is you know this is it if you don't win this tie break you kind of lost the match so you, you yeah. go for it and 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 i did and it worked out and you know i wouldn't say you know kakushkin did anything wrong in that tie break i just played a better tie break than the first set you know what i mean so yeah i would say that that would that's the biggest you know difference that that you have to actually win the match um rather than you know Oh, I was going to say, I'm a, everything I'm hearing you say makes total sense to me. I'm a big believer that transition skills and the ability to actually finish points is what separates levels. And so I, I there's really two ways that I feel like at that level that you're winning points. It's either you are elite at whenever that opportunity comes at actually closing net or that you have an absolute weapon. And for some people, that's being able to hit your spots so well that you're making people uncomfortable or people that have such a weapon that they're overpowering people in a way uh, that they're making people uncomfortable. Do you feel like you're winning uh, the majority of your points by pattern play because you're able to put people in uncomfortable positions with those forced airs or are you forcing airs with your, with the way that you're hitting the ball, whether it be the amount of spin or pace or depth, what is, what is, what is it that you're doing that's forcing airs in your opponents? Yeah, I would say that for me, I think it's, you know, I'm more, I'm, I'm not really a counter puncher. Um, I would say that I'm always trying to, um, you know, implement my game over my opponents. It's not like I'm waiting to see what the other guy is doing. Um, so I feel like uh, I'm always looking to to hit as many winners as possible. So if it's there, I'm gonna hit it. And you know, I'm uh, some matches I lose because. I just kind of, you know, my coach and I call it spray, you know, I, oh yeah, Nick, <laughs> you, you, you sprayed this match, you know? Um, so, but, but when it's there, I'm going to hit it. And, you know, I'm banking on the fact that more times than not, they're going to go in, but of course you have those days where, where, you know, they, you yeah. just miss every, <laughs> every shot you hit kind of, um, or at least that's how it feels like, um, but yeah, so I'll be very aggressive with my serve. I'll be very aggressive with my, especially with my forehand. And then, of course, um, on my return games, well, I'll try to 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 take cuts and, and, and be aggressive there and hopefully uh, force an error that leads to a break. Nick, the play style that you're describing is one that, I'm sure a lot of junior tennis players would love to play that way. Go after the big serve when there's the open quarter, they have that space being able to try to hit winners. And that's not a game that everyone has. And that's obviously a game that you've had to I'm sure put a lot of work in to have the level of success that you've had with that game. 
what's some advice you would give to junior players who want to hit big? What what work do they need to be putting in to be able to be, have success with that game style? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I would say more important than than um, my advice to hitting big or hitting hard is knowing what your game style is, you know, being very aware of, of who you are as a tennis player. Um, because, for example, uh, Kukushkin, he, the, my, my, my opponent in the final there in, te- in Texas, um, he doesn't hit really hard, but he's very, very, very consistent. And he plays um, a tennis which really forces you to, well, I wasn't able to be aggressive, you know, because he hits his back end very flat. And he's mm-hmm. very consistent with it. So he goes cross scored a lot. And I wasn't able to, you know, run around my back end and, and, and hit hard, you know, or, or even with my back end, I wasn't able to, you know, play a lot of back ends above the level of the net where I can go through the ball and, and hit it out. Most of them I had to um, slice back or, just, you know, just rally rally the back end cross court. So I feel like more more than, you know, giving an advice of how to hit hard or, or um, how to play um, aggressive tennis is more knowing who you are as a tennis player and what, what your game is and being very aware of the things that you have to do in order to implement your, your, your game style. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like my, my that's great way advice. I look at it. That's great advice. And another thing that I'm hearing from that is that junior players can take away Uh, For any junior players that actually watch tennis, you maybe recently saw the uh, Alcaraz versus Djokovic match. Uh, Something that people can do against Carlitos to make him uncomfortable is to rush his forehand. He wants to get lots of forehands. Uh, We went through a generation of players who were running around their backhands to forehands all the time. Kakushkin against you was able to make you at least uncomfortable with how flat he's hitting his backhand. So for juniors that are out there practicing, when you're on the practice court, learn to hit your backhand with spin, learn how to hit it flat. Obviously, you need to be able to hit cross court at a very high percentage to to keep your opponent neutralized. But Djokovic, what does he do at an elite level? He can hit that backhand down the line like nobody's business and at an extremely efficient rate. And that's what makes Carlitos uncomfortable playing him. He does something at an elite level that other people just can't. And, and so Kakushkin was making you uncomfortable with this flat backhand. When you can do different things with your backhand, it really changes your game. But you were able to overcome that, obviously. But there's a lot that juniors can take just from hearing you say that on things they maybe need to be doing and practice with their backhand. Having a backhand, like you said, and then to counteract that, you were playing cross-court extremely efficient. You were mixing in the slice when you needed to, even though it wasn't your first choice. And you were able to overcome kind of the way your opponent was playing. So I think those are all good things. What I'd like to do is you, you and I talked a little bit before this and you have kind of a diverse background. You, you grew up not just in one place, but um, have maybe seen the world a little bit differently. You're currently in Madrid. What time is it in Madrid? It's six 30. Perfect. Six seven, 30, seven o'clock. <laughs> so it's seven o'clock in Madrid. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about your experience as a junior player and, and kind of how you grew up so we can better understand you as a tennis player? Yeah, of course. So I I was born in New York. My parents were living there at the time. Um, and shortly after I was born, I moved to the Dominican Republic. And, um, you know, I come from a family who has played a lot of sports. My dad was a, a professional rugby player. Um, so when I moved to the Dominican Republic, I was – doing all sorts of things. I was uh, playing tennis, playing soccer, playing rugby. Um, I was sailing in uh, little boats. I actually competed uh, for a while, like three, four years um, uh, in those little boats that were called Optimist um, and, you know, traveled around the Caribbean um, doing uh, several regattas. Um, and then uh, we decided to move to back to Spain um, and we were there for a year and there I continued to play tennis and, and some soccer. Um, and then we moved to England, um, which was where I met my original coach when I was 11, 
11, 12 years old. Um, and then I played in England. I played soccer. I played rugby. I played tennis, um, badminton. I was doing all sorts of things. And um, it wasn't until I was 14, 15, where I played a um, international tennis tournament in, in um it was a tennis Europe in in Madrid. I came for a for a long weekend. It was called Bank Holidays in London, and I signed up to this tennis Europe. And I, and I, you know, I was in qualies. I qualified, and I ended up. Uh, I think I lost in the semifinal. I think it was semifinal. Um, and I was just. It was like my first ever tournament, and I was, I was, I was so pumped. I, I, I was, you know, so happy and and. And I really like fell in love with it, you know. So I went back to to London. I told my coach, I was like, kind of like this, you know, that you know that competing and and that vibe, you know, feeling the nerves and everything. That that's kind of just kind of cool. I I want to do that more often. And so he started signing me up for these things called match plays in London, which basically it's on the weekends and you play a match against another player you it's kind of it's not a tournament it's just one match on a saturday and then another match on a on a on a sunday and then that gives you like a national ranking um and then you kind of you know work your way up and with that national ranking you can enter you know better or worse tournaments um and so i kind of did that for like two years um so i was 16 17 and then you know, I went to a day school and they're pretty strict on, on leaving school in England. Uh, so I was never homeschooled. I was, I, I went to day school and, and they didn't allow me to, to, you know, skip class or miss weeks of school to, to go and play tournaments. So it was very difficult for me to, you know, have a junior career. Um, but I sort of did, I played around eight, ITF juniors ITFs eight nine I can't remember the, the exact number and I got up to 140 um I won a couple of those tournaments that I played um so that kind of got me uh into you know introduced me to this uh, world that I now live in of you know traveling and and going all around the world playing tennis but of course i I, I that wasn't enough so um I remember that we used to lie uh to our school I used to tell them that I had a, a dentist appointment or a, a, a doctor's appointment um so my dad would would or my dad or my mom would write a letter saying Nicholas has a you know an, a, an appointment at the dentist he won't be able to go to to, to <laughs> you know to the first part of the of, of today's um you know, schedule or whatever. And then I would go and play a, a, a tennis match and then I would go to school. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then when I was um, during like my holidays, so uh, summer, Christmas, Easter, you know, the typical uh, holidays that, that schools have, I would just, that's where I played my, my, my junior tournaments and I would sign up and, um, yeah, go and travel and, and play the ITFs. Um, so so when I graduated, I I always really wanted to go to school because uh to sorry to college because um I thought it was the best way for me to play a bunch of tennis and and compete a lot. Um, so I started contacting uh schools um in the U.S. Obviously, I wanted to go to the U.S. and play. Um, at a division one um, and I knew I had you know the level to play at division one because we were training a lot uh, my coach and I we would train every afternoon for like two and a half hours and but we but I never had the goal of oh yeah I'm gonna train to go play this tournament you know so that was very hard for me just to like um, you know just constantly day in day out train without having you know a goal of i'm gonna go play this tournament in three weeks um but i, I mean i loved tennis and and i was super motivated and 
And back then, I don't know if, if kids are doing this nowadays, but I didn't really have a, a, a ranking, uh, an ITF ranking at, at the time, or it wasn't that good. So I had, um, I did this little video that I could send um, to different schools of me, <laughs> you know, like playing cross court, playing a couple points, um, serving, returning, just, you know, the whole the highlight whole thing, reel, you know, a yeah. highlight reel. Exactly. And so I sent it to, to, uh, to some schools about like six or seven schools that, I, you know, I looked up on Google and that I was interested in. And some of them got back to me, others didn't. Um, and then I went to visit my older brother who was studying in Santa Barbara. And I visited him because I had, you know, I was coming back from a tournament or something. I was like, oh, I'm just going to go visit my brother. And when I was there, I was, I, I, I just thought, oh, why don't I just go to um, my, okay, sorry, the, the men's tennis coach's office and I introduced myself and, and maybe, you know, get to know him and, and who knows. And so uh, my brother got me in contact with him. He got me his email or whatever. And I emailed him and we met up and I was like, well, I really, I really like this guy. He's, he's super nice. And it seems that he knows a lot about tennis. And then I told him a bit about myself, a bit about my background. And he was interested in me too. Um, obviously that guy is Mar Marty Davis. He's now retired. He did, he, he's not the head coach there anymore. Now it's Blake Muller. Um, but Blake Muller was my assistant coach. Uh, while I was there and so we stayed in touch and then he a couple weeks later when I was back home he emailed me and and you know he gave me an offer uh, which I liked and um, yeah I was kind of still talking to the other schools but uh, the other schools weren't really like were they weren't as interested as as Marty was and I was like, well, I figured, you know, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's a good coach. He's interested in me. I'm just going to go to Santa Barbara. And we went, I was sorry, I went there and I never looked back and I couldn't be more grateful for everything they've done for me. And, um, you know, I had an unbelievable time. Uh, the coaches there, um, even the voluntary assistant coach, Jeff Crosby, he's, unbelievable guy and the whole community and um yeah everything was was so perfect for the four years that i was there um and i i really really liked my uh experience there i thought that the coaches you know did a great job and still do of developing players um and you know i always say that santa barbara is a um is a school where each player is an is a uh it, like um how how do i say it uh um a separate you know program in itself you know they they really oh developing try and, them yeah correct they yeah, have their own they development really, plan exactly they they really um focus on developing each player no matter where they play on the lineup you know which i think that is is really good um and yeah i graduated and i remember i i walked on a friday and on saturday i was in cancun playing uh qualities of the futures <laughs> a legendary cancun i've heard many things about tennis in cancun yeah yeah not everyone's favorite i've heard it's an no it's definitely place. not mine definitely not mine yeah so that is quite the background story. Uh, just listening to that, I think something that people can take away from that is one, not everyone has the same background in tennis and obviously can have a lot of success. Uh, the second thing is, I think a lot of times in the United States, junior players are obsessed with rankings. They're obsessed with ratings. Then we've got you over here as someone here like, ah, I didn't play a lot of ITFs. I didn't, I didn't have, you know, I wasn't super crazy obsessed with my rankings. I just played, I competed, you loved it. And then you, you, you put out your highlight reel, you were proactive about reaching out to colleges, you were open to different opportunities, and, and then obviously the right doors open for you. Obviously, it doesn't always work out that perfectly, but it worked out great for you. 
uh, it's just a, it's a nice reminder that not everyone's path uh, is the same. And someone just tried to call me. Sorry, I'll have to edit that out. But not everyone's not everyone's journey uh, is the same. So obviously, um, you you kind of had a unique beginning to this point, it was a unique uh, journey. So here's my follow-up questions. Did you grow up playing on hard courts, clay? What did you grow up playing on? Green green clay. In the Dominican Republic, it was green clay. And then, okay. well, I, I wouldn't say that if that was, you know, I would, didn't grow up there. I played when I was, you know, from when I started playing, which was four to 10. Um, but then my the majority of my upbringing, which was in London, I played indoor hard, lightning fast. Yeah. So a little bit of all of it. That's a, it's a little bit. Those are some different yeah. surfaces for sure. Yeah. Did you? I guess when you were younger, you would have saw the different places that you maybe felt like you were plateauing or you needed to break through uh, in order to continue to develop and be the player that you are now. If you could go back and give advice to yourself at thirteen, and then maybe again to yourself at eighteen, what are some things that you would share? with your younger self that maybe would even help you be farther along than you are now, or that would have helped you to overcome some of those hurdles in your junior and college and even professional career. Yeah. I mean, I would say that I think giving the situation that I was in for all of my junior career, I think we did an unbelievable job. Because yeah, I don't disagree. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was just so hard to to even get courts in London. You know, it's just mm -hmm. it, it's raining all the time, um, so it's so hard to to get two hours in a row, and then you know, let alone the fact that I wasn't able to travel and play tournaments. Um, I remember my coach every Wednesday we would play sets, so that was for me like what I was looking for. You know, I wasn't mm -hmm. looking forward for a tournament i was looking forward for wednesday because that's kind of where i could show my coach and myself you know that i can do the things that we've been practicing on you know so monday and tuesday we were practicing something we would try and implement them on the sets that we played on wednesday and then thursday and friday we would kind of like work on the things that i did bad on the on the sets that i played on wednesday you know so I literally couldn't tell you, oh, I would tell myself to be more this or to be more that. I feel like, and I, I mean, the majority of that I owe to my coach and my parents, you know, because, you know, they did a tremendous job um, with me given the situation that, that I was in. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my, my answer. Um, in college, uh same thing, to be honest. I, I really, you know, I'm the type of guy that when I work with someone, you know, as a coach or just in, in life in general, I kind of like um, give my whole heart into whatever I'm doing, you know. So when I arrived in Santa Barbara, I was kind of all about everything or and anything that the coaches said, you know. So if they wanted to, I remember my, it was like a second or third day there. We went into practice and my, my coach had a written in a, in a whiteboard doubles one oh one, And the way we, the way he wanted us to play doubles. And I just focused on, on trying to, you know, do the things that he wanted us to do and, and meet the goals. And, and I feel like that was, that was, you know, the same, uh, in my academics and in my tennis and in my fitness. So I was always, you know, I really trusted the people that I had around me. Um, maybe, you know, I was lucky enough to have a really good relationship with, with my coaches and my teammates. Um, and, and yeah, so I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that I regret um, anything or I would change anything that, that I, that, that I did, you know, throughout my, my college career. No, that's a good answer. I usually, somebody has something they'd like to work on 
uh, at different points, but obviously it's such a unique circumstance. I didn't, I never really thought about how much it rains uh, and how hard it would be to get that. I mean, of, time. of course I had, I have things that I would say, Oh yeah, you messed up there. You know, I, but, but it's not because I was advised otherwise, you know, it's just things right. that I'm sure everyone, you know, has things like, Oh, if you would have done this, maybe that wouldn't have happened. But, you know, that's very easy to say in hindsight, you know, at the, yeah. in that moment in time, you know, I made that decision because I thought it was the best one for me, you know, but now knowing myself, I remember, for example, in college, halfway through college, I was playing with a Technifiber and halfway through college, I changed rackets and I thought it was the right move um, because once again, they weren't making that Technifiber that I, that I, that I was playing it. And it turned out that it was horrible for me, you know, mm -hmm. but back then, you know, I talked to my coaches and I talked to, you know, I tried different rackets and, and I thought that was the right move, but, in, you know, looking back, obviously it wasn't. So I yeah. would, I would change that, but it's not something that I had that I, that I did intentionally, you know? Right. Do you uh, feel like from that experience that there's anything that you're working on right now in your current practice sessions that you're trying to get over the hump to be someone who's main drawing slams and not having to worry about qualies that you wish you would have worked on that skill set a little bit more in college? Or is there anything that you feel like you could have been doing that would have really moved the needle for you developmentally that you wish you would have put a little more focus in one area? Um. Yes and no. I would say that in terms of tennis, um, you always have, no matter what point you're on, you always have something to work on, you know, because right. if the number one player in the world is working on something, then you really have to be working on something, you know, and I've, and I've, and I've always said that, like, for me, I've never been like, oh, that's, I'm, I'm good, you know. Like, no, every day I'm like, I wish I did this better. I wish I did that better. You know, I'm always working on something. Um, but something that when I got, when I graduated and, you know, two years onwards, I was like, oh, I wish I didn't spend this time doing that was my fitness. And I feel like, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I'm very grateful for the strength that we did, you know, the strength training that we did in college and uh, all the different strength coaches that I had in college. But I feel like they really have to be careful with what they do because they are managing a team rather than a player. And so I think it's very difficult for them to manage a group of, of, of players that are different within themselves rather than working one-on-one -on -one with a player, you know? And I feel like, for me, you know, when I when I graduated, well, actually, before I graduated in summer, I was working with my strength coach now. Um, and I remember the first couple of sessions I was I thought I was fit and strong, but, but I was a complete disaster, you know, and I feel like that's uh, more and more each year that the, 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 you know, game, the game of tennis becomes um very physical and you can see how hard players are hitting it now and how long they can last on court you know at a very um high level so i feel like um i really spent a lot of time between 18 and 22 improving my fitness and i feel like i would have wanted to do that before because i feel like if i had the 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 shape that I was in when I was 21 or 22 in college I think I would have been a way better player yeah and I think that's great advice that all junior players and college players can take in anybody that's trying to find their next level if you can find that next level of fitness it it pays huge dividends uh, especially late in matches but even just in your overall level of play you obviously, to get to the level you're at, you've put in a lot of practice over the years. What do you think a quality practice session looks like? What 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 does a practice have to have to for you to consider consider it a good practice session or of quality? 
Yeah, I think being very specific with what you want to do on your game. Um, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of players that um, spent a lot of time going doing cross scores and, and down the lines. Um, I feel like that's very important. Um, but if there are things that you have to work on, be very specific, um, especially knowing when you're going to use it in a match, you know, um, because there's times where you, where you play, um, sorry, where you train uh, things like cross scored or down lines, or, you know, there's a drill where you, you were hitting with your partner in the tram line. And those are, you know, those are good because they work on your control and your accuracy. Um, but I feel like what I really like to do is, you know, with my coach, I always, you know, we hit down the middle, then we hit cross score, and then we do a couple down the lines. And that takes us about, you know, eight or 10 minutes. And then I'll be like, I'm ready. And then we go into, you know, our specific stuff and, and we'll work on, you know, specific shots that I struggle with um, in, in a match. Um, and then we'll practice the things that I do really well, you know, to, to keep, um, making sure that, that, that I feel good about them. So I, so, so they keep being a strength in my game. Um, and then we, we look, well, we look at the way I play and then we try and replicate, um, that in practice and practice those, you know, set plays or, um, adding stuff to those set plays that I could do better. But basically where I'm trying to get to is be very specific with what you want to work on based on the type of player that you are, which is kind of what I was saying before about really knowing your, who, who you are as a tennis player, your style. Um, so yeah, that's kind of our main, you know, um, way of, of looking at practice. I think purposeful practice is something that everyone should really be locked in on. I, I get that answer from people pretty consistent, consistently. Uh, and, I, and the way that you describe it makes total sense. It always, I always come back to there's this old Federer quote where he talks about uh, it's his job to continue to sharpen his strengths, that his, his opponents are going to pick on his weaknesses enough. But for those of us that aren't god tier level tennis players i think that we have to continue to work on our weaknesses as well and to sharpen those as best as we can uh so we have the opportunity to even use our strengths because if we have gapping gaping holes in our games then obviously uh it's it's gonna cause problems for us when we're out there competing when you you obviously had you played junior tennis you played college tennis and now you've played at the pro level is is there anything that you would like to see change at any level of tennis? Is there anything that you'd like to see change uh, at the pro tour level or at the college level or even with junior tennis and the way that it's currently structured? Well, I think that, for example, now at the junior level, I know that top 10 juniors get eight, I think eight wild cards into main draw challengers. Um, and of course they get wild cards into, into futures. Um, I don't know if, if eight wild cards into the main drop challengers is good because I think that the, the differences in level is still pretty big. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I, I would be, I would change it for eight wild cards into the qualities of a challenger, um, or maybe four into the qualities and four into the main draw. Um, but I think that's a great initiative to, you know, help kickstart your, your pro career. And I would, and, and I'm definitely about it. Um, and then of course, at the college level, uh, you have the same thing. Now I think the, the top 16 players, I don't know, I don't know the rule, but, or, or the, it's the, a new program. Or, I think we're all still learning it. So. Yeah. Um, but basically the same thing, they get eight wild cards into, into challengers. And I think that's really you know they really deserve that because college tennis is is very high you know the level is very high um and those guys are you know spending a lot of time on court and they're doing a lot of effort 
you know, with their academics too. And they deserve to be, you know, gifted with, with wild cards and two good tournaments like, like the challengers um, at a professional level. Um, I think a lot of players around my ranking would agree that we deserve a bit more money. Um, and I feel like, the ATP is really trying to work on it and we're very grateful about it. Um, but, you know, you can see uh, quote unquote challenger players doing a lot of damage when they play up in higher events. Yeah. Um, and then you also see, um, you know, guys that are playing mostly ATPs when they come down and play a challenger level, it's not like they breeze through the draws and, and, and win these these challenger events easily so what i'm trying to say is that i think the the difference in level is is not that big um and obviously the the you know the guys that are playing atp tournaments throughout the year or so what i mean solely atp tournaments throughout the year they're they're playing at a very high level but but what i mean is that you know someone who is top 150 or, you know, top 170 and in between 170 and 60, in between 170 and 80, I think the the, the difference in level is not that high, but the difference in prize money is. It's huge. So, so, so I feel like, you know, and there, as I said, I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm, I think the ATP is doing a great job uh, trying to improve that. But of course I would, I would say that that's the biggest um, you know, thing that we want to see change. I personally would love to see, and you could think that I'm crazy, but I think anyone who is paying attention this year, they've expended, expanded some of the draws of the Masters 1000s. And then during those tournaments, there were all these headlines about these upsets that were happening that you and I both know really weren't that big of upsets because these people that were getting in that don't normally get into these draws are quality players. Expand that draw even further. I think Masters 1000 events should be a 128 draw. And I think you need to give people the opportunity to play these events. And then I think uh, I would love to see slams be a 256 draw. And I only the top 32 seeds get a buy one round of a buy. And then there's the opportunity for this. If you're a top 250 player in the world, all of a sudden there's four events a year where you're getting a quality first round paycheck, even if you're losing first round. And now you've got $120,000 with which you can use to schedule the rest of your events years year round. And, and you kind of have this base that maybe right now doesn't exist because people are constantly worried about just protecting their ranking or whatever that might look like. But if we expand some of these draws uh, with the way that the money looks, even when you lose first round now, um, I think that we could create enough of a kind of a protected salary that people could go out and actually schedule their tournaments and the rest of their calendar year, the way that they need to, that the game can finally kind of grow organically in the way that it needs to. And I think it just comes from expanding draws and giving more people opportunities. If these top players are so good, they shouldn't have to worry about losing to these guys ranked, you know, 200 in the world, 170 in the world, but you and I both know, those guys ranked 170 in the world are good, really good, and that they have the sure. opportunity to beat some of these other guys. So that's something that I would like to see. I don't know exactly know how they they get into doing that. I just would love to see more people get opportunities. And like you say, some of that money from the top needs to trickle down. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't see at least 450 guys making a career, a solid career, a very lucrative career playing tennis uh, long term. And hopefully they'll keep trending that direction. Do you have any other tennis hot takes? Uh, something that you're just passionate about? I can give you an example I mean, if you need to think. The other day someone came yeah. on and said uh, they think that we should get rid of lets on at all levels. Um, yeah, do you have so, anything? Yeah, I I think about. I mean, uh, I I think about these things a lot, and I talk to my coach. Um, about them, you know, we brainstorm and mostly at dinner when, when we're going or looking back at, at the day. Um, but I feel like, um, we always come to the same conclusion and it's, 
there's so much history in tennis that some of these changes that we make might affect, you know, the outcome or might change the way that tennis is played. And therefore, for example, what I mean is you're, you're saying about the Grand Slams and changing them into, you know, having buys and stuff. But, you know, Grand Slams are used to kind of show or, um, uh, how can I say it? Like now that, you know, the GOAT debate about who has the, the, uh, the most amount of slams, it's mm-hmm. kind of used as a barometer. Is that you, right? Can you, a measuring can you stick. say that? A, yeah. me- a measuring stick. And, and, and I feel like if, if you change the format, then you might change the outcome of the players that are in that conversation that maybe aren't supposed to be in that conversation. You know what I mean? And, and yeah, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of things that we can, that we, that, you know, that you can change um, and you see that, you know, different competitions are, are um, experimenting with it. Like for example, in college you have the let's um, and then, you know, at the, at the next gen, you have all that format, which we all know about. Um, So yeah, it's definitely a, a, a conversation to be had, but I feel like no changes should be made that may affect the history of tennis you don't Um, so you don't like my idea of having grand slams that have back draws i wouldn't (laughs) i i mean i do like it i do like it but but i feel like not in such a big event you know what i mean like i i like the i like i like the idea but i don't know if i would use it in a grand slam event I'd love, know? To, I'd love to see where they play the back draw all the way out to third place. And you can't come back. It's not going to disrupt the front draw. But let's say that I traveled all the way to Wimbledon. That's a far trip for me. And I go to watch, and my favorite player to watch is, I really wanted to go see Grigor Dimitrov. And he ends up losing in the first round. Let's say that happens. Now I've made this huge trip, and my favorite player is out of the, out of the draw. Now, as a true tennis fan, there's probably other people I can go watch while I'm there. I'm still going to have a great time. But let's say that there's a different place. Uh, they, they, they decide how they're going to use the courts. And in the back draw, uh, when you lose, they're playing. Instead of, uh, instead of regular scoring, now all of a sudden in the back draw, it's no ad. Now all of a sudden in the back draw, it's fast four, three out of five sets, fast four format, no ad. And on whatever courts they're playing these back draw matches, uh, every match that these guys play, you're, they're playing every round they win is only worth $5,000 and it's five ATP points, but it gives these people a chance to get more matches, more money, and, and a few more ranking points. And uh, on those courts, uh, the fans can come in and out whenever they want. They can cheer whenever they want. They, there's food, there's music playing. There's like, it's, it's a party. All of a sudden, I feel like the backdrop courts are going to be more exciting and there's going to be more people flocking there than they are to the main draw. Uh, if you yeah. allow it to be an event, I, I I agree, and I think it would be it would be super that would be a super cool event, and and definitely a lot of people would want to go, but I wouldn't do it at Wimbledon. No, you probably not I mean? Wimbledon, but you see what I'm saying though. But it I would be cool. Yeah, no, it I could see, be cool. I see what I, I see what you're saying, but I would do it. I wouldn't do it at a, at a Slam. You know, I would do it maybe at the Atlanta Open or uh, yeah, I don't know. That'd be awesome. Or for example, I've heard people say. Oh yeah, grand, you know, grand slam. These guys are killing themselves. It's not, it's not sustainable for their body. You know, five sets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then what? Are you going to change it to three? And then all of a sudden, you see someone get, you know, it's eight, ten slams. So then, you know, someone who has eight slams or ten slams, I don't know how many Agassi he has, but you know, to get to get ten slams, best through five sets, that's that's incredible. You know. Yeah. It's and, a different accomplishment to, if it's well, best of three. Even even get even get one slam. It's like oh, I yeah. feel like it's the the pinnacle of of sports. You know what I mean? So so to change things like that that maybe you know compared to what there is in history, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't want it to see happen. 
Um, I want it, I, I want whatever has been done in tennis to still have the same weight moving forward. If you get what I mean, you know, so to win, to win 14 Roland Garros like Nadal has, that's going to be the same weight for, for, for the, you know, for the rest of whatever. Yeah. Roland Garros. Yeah. For the rest of history, you know, um, but I wouldn't want a rule to be changed at the French open that can maybe alter that, um, I would love to they I'd love to see them start it maybe at ATP 250s or at these new highest level challengers yeah. that they have or something like that. And then like I said, they don't have to play all the way back out to where it's like you have to beat the person in first twice to win the tournament or something like that. Play it out and make it a big deal to get third place at these events. Make it a big right. deal to get this extra exactly. prize money, to get these extra points, to get this extra fan interaction, make it more of an event for spectators, make it exciting, make it fun. Uh, they, they have, yeah. they can experiment at some of these lesser events. I totally agree with everything you're saying. Uh, but there is some wiggle room for some more guys that maybe are losing early in events to still get ranking points, to still get more money and to make it an even more fun I experience think, for fans. I think for, for sure, my biggest change would be do more team events, starting with the yes. Davis Cup. I think, the, I think the Davis Cup should be played every four years, like every other, you know, world world cups Mm -hmm. quote unquote and and i bet you that every four years you'll have the the best players of every country absolutely killing themselves on court um Mm -hmm. in order to to win the the davis cup um and then you know if it's not a a team event for for like at a at an international level uh representing your com your country you know have team events where uh, you have um, owners of those teams and they have a budget and they can, um, you know, sign different players with different rankings and then they go and play a tournament. And I think that would be, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of players that I know that would really, really enjoy that and and give their absolute best, you know, because then you have, you know, everything that surrounds that kind of what happens in soccer, you know, Oh, Miami FC just signed Lionel Messi. Um, Real Madrid are going to sign this coach. The Real Madrid are going to, you know, they just fired this coach. Oh my God. He's transferring to this team, you know? Um, yeah. I think that would be, that, that, that would be a really good change for, for tennis. No, I would love that. I'd love to see some team events and they should definitely, they should definitely play around with that. And then obviously all they'd have to do with if they did uh, that Davis Cup format you're talking about, it's every two years is Olympics, two years the Davis Cup event, then two years to Olympics, two years the Davis Cup event. So that's, they have a little break in between with the four years alternating, however that would work. That would be, I think they definitely should look into something like that. Davis Cup needs the excitement that it used to have in this new format. It's not been nearly as exciting, I don't think. Nick, could you tell us what is your happiest tennis moment? Uh, I mean, I feel like, you know, as as your career goes on, the bigger tournaments you win, you know, I feel like they take over from your previous, you know, accomplishments, sort of say. Um, but I would... So I, obviously, I would say my first challenger last year. That was that was a very happy moment for me because, um, you know, I had a year full of injuries, and to be able to get a, a challenger, which we were been working for, was was, you know, something that that I was really proud of. Um, but I would say, you know, winning my conference with my team at Santa Barbara four years in a row. Um, that's something that I will always take with me because as I said, I'm, I, I love team events and doing with, doing it with different individuals and, and doing it representing a community and a program that I feel very represented to. Um, that was, you know, one of my happiest memories. Um, and then I would say playing Wimbledon last year, was 
uh, another one of those because um, having lived in England um, for eight years and I remember when Wimbledon qualities came around, I would skip school and I would, you know, call in sick to school and I would go and watch qualities and I would just spend the whole day watching these uh, players play when I was little. So having, you know, gone to college and and gotten to the point where I can actually play the, in these tournaments that I look up, looked up to when I was little, it's like you see the full circle kind of thing, you know, and, and I'm just, I was really proud of, of doing it. And, and now my next goal is to, to play main draw these, you know, these events. No, I think that's a great goal. And I think those are great moments. Um, here at the Grassroots Tennis Pod, we believe in giving people their flowers. Who is someone underappreciated in the tennis community? I feel Djokovic. You feel like Djokovic is underappreciated in the tennis community? I feel like, from what I hear, um, obviously, you know, don't get me wrong, the guy is, he's got everything he ever wanted and and more, I would say, and he's obviously, you know, set for life. But what I mean is, you, I always hear how Djokovic is the um, bad guy, you know, right in 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 the in the tennis world. But I feel like he does so much for for us as tennis players. You know, he does so much for the guys that are less ranked, um, and he always represents us he always you know sticks his head out and if he and he's kind of like fine with being the bad guy quote unquote you know but in our eyes as as players he's he's definitely not the bad guy so um yeah i kind of i always you know support him and 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 i and i love watching him win because i think he's such a genuine guy you know what I mean? Um, I agree. I think part of why he gives so much back to kind of the lower ranked players personally, I think that his son's going to play tennis. And I think he knows for his own son to, he doesn't care if his son's the number one in the world or anything like that. But I think he realized his son wants to do what he does and loves the game. And I think he's trying to give back a little bit and create a world where, you know, maybe if his son's not a top 10 player, that he can still play and love and make a living, you know, loving the same game that he did. I think that he might have that vision. I'm He's never came out and said that, but if you just kind of look at that relationship he has with his kids, I, I wonder if that's not part of it, but he does. I do. I think you're right. He gives back and he sticks up uh, for kind of the, the guys that are ranked in those middle tiers and uh, in a way that maybe some people have it in the past. And he does catch a lot of flack uh, and, and negative stuff along the way for just different different things that that oftentimes seems unfair uh, just because people are such big fans of Federer and Djokovic or Federer and Nadal that they give Djokovic uh, a really hard time for no reason exactly. so it's frustrating yeah. um last question I could talk to a brick wall for an hour I could probably pick your brain all day but I'll, I'll let you go here this is the last one who do you think needs to come on the grassroots tennis podcast Keep in mind, whoever you say, you have to help us get this person on the pod. I've been encouraging people to give us two, I, but from you, I will take one. Who has a great tennis mind or has a story they really just need to share? Whose brain do we need to pick? Who do you think needs to come on here and give back to the tennis community? I mean, I have, off the top of my head, I have a lot of guys, you know, and some girls that... I would love for you to talk to them, but also bear in mind your question that I have to help you get. I don't know to... these people. You do, but I don't. That's yeah. we're not in any hurry either. It could, it's not like I gotta have them, you know, tomorrow or next week. Uh, I mean, I would for sure um, say my coach. Uh, I think he's okay. You know, he's had a, a really cool story and uh cool upbringing um but if i had to pick someone who 
you know, isn't so close to me. Uh, I don't know right now. It's it's something I would have to think of because I just don't want to say, you know, a random name and, and, you know, whatever. Like, I, I really think that, you know, I'm super, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative that, you know, you, you contacted me and, and, you know, going back to your previous questions about who would you give flowers to in, in the tennis community? I feel like there's a lot of people that, you know, no one knows about in, in local clubs and, 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 um, you know, all around the world that don't have a platform to, to express their thoughts and, and their, um, uh, contribution to the, t to the tennis community. And I feel like they deserve, um, flowers, you know, because they do it for the love of the game. And, um, so I would love to, to, you know, maybe speak about, or, or sorry, tell you some of these guys that, that I know that, you know, are literally in love with the game, but they never have the opportunity or the, the chance to, you know, compete and play and, and travel the world. And I feel like they must have really cool stories and they deserve the flowers, you know? hundred percent. We've actually had, we've had some really great interviews with coaches, uh, some community leaders and such. It's not all about just the players. Um, I, I love picking the brain of someone who's just passionate because I believe passionate people speak the same love language. So we will, we'll, we'll put your coach down. We'll pencil him in. What's his name? His name is Glenn. Okay. Coach Glenn. And uh, we'll get, we'll kind of get that figured out at some point. And then if you think of anyone else that you're just like, this guy's a great person, whatever it might be, it might be a tournament director. It might oh, be someone who? that's a volunteer. I, I actually saw that you follow him. His name's Wolf. He's, um, he's Taylor Fritz's physio. And I, yes. I had a, I had a, I had a, um, had the opportunity to get to know him when I was uh, invited for um, the Davis cup uh early on in in the year and you know i always i talk so much tennis with him and he's i don't know if you've interviewed him um or I'm he's not. been at the podcast but he 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 loves tennis and he knows a lot about tennis and of course he's 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 super um uh you know involved in at the top of the game you know because he's he's taylor fritz's physio so um yeah and he's a really really nice guy Really nice guy. I love picking people's brain, especially when they're passionate about the game. And obviously that would be a great one too. Nick, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Um, I think uh, anyone that obviously hears this interview is going to say, man, I got to follow this guy a little bit more closely. Where can people find you on social media if they want to follow your journey? Yeah, my Instagram. I I say that I, that's the place that i'm most active um, okay and it's at it's at nicholas m d e a all right and it's nicholas guys without an h n-i-c-o-l-a-s m-d-e-a make sure and give this man a follow he's going to be doing big things uh we're going to see him wimbledon main draw very soon i feel it i'm feeling it and uh, for all the rest of you out there that are listening to the Grassroots Tennis Pod, please, if you love what we're doing here, make sure to subscribe on YouTube and Spotify. We're currently in the process of getting all of our episodes to everywhere that you enjoy listening to your podcast. Also, make sure and share this with someone that you know loves tennis. Um, if you give us a follow on socials, on Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter, we are doing follow for follow. If you follow us and you love the pod, we want to follow you too. We're all friends here at the pod. And last but not least, um, if you have any follow questions or you do know someone who should be on the Grassroots Tennis Podcast, email us at grassrootstennispod at gmail.com. Thanks, guys.